Special uh, RSG webinar, a special town hall on applying design thinking to product selection. Uh, my name is Jared Jingris. I'm the managing director and one of the analysts here at Real Story Group, and I'm um, really thrilled to be joined by my colleague Tony Byrne, the founder of Real Story Group, and a special guest, uh, Lou Rosenfeld, the publisher of Rosenfeld Media. So. Couple, couple housekeeping items. Um, we have a hashtag for today's event called Select Tech. If you want to um, have some conversations in the uh, Twitterverse, please feel free to do that. Uh, if you have questions, this the second half of this session today is going to be your questions. So we, we really invite you to to submit any questions that you might have via the uh, go to webinar control panel on the right side of your of your screen. We'll queue up the questions there and get to as many of, of, of those questions as we can as time allows. This is scheduled for an hour today, um, but we're going to just uh, kick things off with a couple a couple topics and then like I said the second half will be all about you and your questions and, and we'll get to uh, we'll get to as many of, of those as we can so without further ado let's do a couple introductions um, first I mentioned our special guest Lou uh, welcome and uh, why don't you tell the, the fine folks on the on, on the webinar today a little bit about you and, and Rosenfeld media sure thing thanks Jared and great to be here uh, with you and, and Tony, an old friend, uh, I think we go back around, gosh, 15, 20 years now. Glad to finally work uh, with Tony and Jared as publisher. Uh, Rosenfeld Media is a publisher known best for its books on user experience. And um, we have uh, about 30 or so. I have those uh, uh, shown on the slide here. Um, and uh, we have a few other things that we've been doing the last couple of years. Uh, uh, we've put on the Enterprise UX conference uh, three years in a row. Uh, we'll be in San Francisco in June. Uh, we also do uh, the new conference uh, that's going to be just next week, the Design Operations Summit in uh, New York City. And uh, we do books uh, that you could sort of say are about design thinking, which we'll come to in a moment. But uh, we also work with uh, Real Story Group, uh, Jared and Tony's company, on the Digital Reality Check series, of which uh, we published the Digital and Marketing Asset Management book by Teresa Regley last year, and just recently, uh, Jared and Tony's book, The Right Way to Select Technology, which we'll be certainly talking about today. Great. Thanks, Lou. And the other member of our of our trio uh, on the line today is like my, my colleague and founder of Real Story Group, Tony Byrne. Tony, why don't you tell the folks about Real Story Group and what we do? Yeah, hey, Jared, Lou, and everyone online, it's great to be here. Real Story Group is a 16-year-old analyst firm. We do very detailed evaluations of digital workplace and digital marketing technologies. You can see a list of what we cover here. We're a little bit different from other analyst firms that we are completely on your side of the table. We're completely customer-focused, um, and so our analysis is typically known for being harder hitting, more critical, and more detailed. Uh, from a technology standpoint. And so obviously what a lot of our subscribers use this research for is to help them select technologies and this is something that we advise them uh, either over the phone or in person and, and part of what this book is today is an encapsulation of the methodologies that we've developed over the last 16 years. And so these are some of the vendors that we cover. We put it all, decided to put it all in one sort of infographic, uh, and you can download this from our website at realstorygroup.com slash vendor map. But, you know, there's obviously a lot of different choices out there. You do have in the city center some main big-time players, obviously, like Microsoft, Oracle, SAP, IBM, et cetera, uh, who cover a number of different technologies. So each technology segment or marketplace is represented here as a particular subway line. But the reality is that a lot of the innovation is happening out in the periphery. You have many, many, many choices. Um, and we try to evaluate as many of these major uh, firms as we can, but also open source and some of the smaller regional players as well, because again, these are highly fragmented marketplaces um, and you have many choices. So the question then becomes, well, how do I, how do I make this choice? And so that's what this whole discussion today is all about. 
Great, thanks, thanks, Lou, and thanks, Tony. Um, let's let's kick it off with our first topic, and that is kind of a a level setting topic. And I'll, I'll direct this one to Lou. Now, Lou, what is design thinking? Oh gosh, you know. So first of all, uh, when you guys asked me to talk about it, I cringed a moment because it's almost becoming. Uh, a, a bit of a, a, a trendy uh, a discussion topic, certainly in my field of user experience design, uh, where um, you know uh, it's bandied about quite a bit. But beneath that uh, trendiness is something that's really pretty important. First of all, it's uh, something that's been growing for years and years. Uh, you can see just according to Google when we when I did a, a quick search in the the Google zeitgeist, it, it does not seem to be waning. Uh, we see uh, design thinking becoming more and more uh, interesting to more and more people uh, outside the design world, which is kind of an interesting point to make about it. First of all, when senior people uh, in large organizations who make decisions talk about design, they're often learning about it through this, this concept of design thinking. It's, uh, we're not looking to make those senior decision makers designers, but we're trying to bring them some of the goodness of problem solving from a designer's perspective. Why don't we go to the next slide? So Wikipedia actually has uh, a very uh, a decent entry on design thinking, and I only bring it up here. Don't expect you to read all that, but I want you to see that uh, the term has been around for quite a while. Uh, it's not something that just popped up in the last few years. Uh, Wikipedia actually points back to Herb Simon's uh, seminal book, The Sciences of the Artificial, which was back in 69, uh, as, as well as McKim's 73 book. Uh, most people um, have heard about it in the last uh, 15, 20 years, uh, actually a little longer, 25 years, uh, partly because that's when it started to become popularized and commercialized, uh, certainly by IDEO, a large uh, agency uh, that has really uh, distinguished itself around design thinking and, and using that type of problem solving to work uh, essentially more and more as a management consultancy. So uh, we're certainly hearing about it um, uh, more in those years since it's become commercialized. IDEO uses this definition. Design thinking can be described as a discipline, probably, that uses a designer's sensibility and methods, that's how we solve problems, to match, to match people's needs with what's technologically feasible. So there's a, 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 an ever enlarging canvas of what can be done with technology but we need design thinking methods and tools to actually figure out how to humanize that technology and make it work for people. And then it gets into this whole, what, let's match what a viable business strategy is with customer value and market opportunity. So we're looking at design thinking basically as a set of tools, in this case in the hand of the hands of decision makers, that help us figure out uh, how to create greater business value by ultimately creating greater value for customers and users. That's a good enough definition, I think, of design thinking. Uh, I don't know if I can do any. Sounds like we kind of lost Lou's audio here, but um, I'm sure he was just about to tell you about how design thinking impacted this uh, this new book that Tony and I um, wrote in the, in the past year that, that Lou's firm published for us. And, uh, you know, we're going to talk about each of the the six parts that we outline in the in the book today, in terms of how we applied some of that some of that design thinking, some of that some of that uh, the notions of user centered design in in really trying to shake up the way that that firms traditionally talk about uh, or, or go about selecting new technology. And with that as a segment, Tony, let's talk a little bit about some of the problems with the more of the traditional way of of selecting technology. Yeah, I mean, there's 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 many problems uh, associated with it, and I and I love the way that that Lou cued this up, talking about being kind of more human, um, being more creative about it, applying uh, against real business problems and matching it up against market opportunities. And the problem with the approach that we have today is that it comes from a legacy, really a two or three de decade legacy of various sort of waterfall approaches, where I make just a big decision, often based on very limited sort of information and. So we joke about this mystical quadrant, you know, we, we, everybody loves to make fun of quadrants and waves, but really I founded Real Story Group based on a, on a quadrant. We were, I was working for a systems integration company 
And we were implementing a tool that had been in the top right quadrant. And we were having all kinds of problems with it. I mean, it fundamentally didn't work unless you heavily extended it and built on top of it and kind of completely rejiggered it. And the customer came to us and said, well, it's in the top right quadrant. Why are you guys, you know, what are you doing wrong? And that was really kind of opened my eyes that there had to be a different way uh, of evaluating and selecting these technologies than based on this kind of simple horse race where you pick one because of some, you know, generic ranking by someone else. So um, we're just a little curious to see just how many of you have maybe experienced this. And then we'll, uh, Jared's going to push a little poll here out to you. And we'll see, you know, feel free to answer. Um, has your company ever had a failed technology selection? So that could be, yeah, we had one, or yes, we've actually had several. Um, or no, we've actually done a pretty good job of this. And for those of you who say no, uh, we certainly would welcome uh, your comments about what you had done right um, in along the way in terms of selecting technology that you were that you were so successful. So, um, so it looks like uh, we've the the results are in, and I think if we it looks like it's about 97 percent of you. Um, I think Jared, if we close the poll, it puts up the the yeah. the, the data, but. 97% of you have had either one or actually several failed technology selections. So that's pretty um, pretty damning, I would say, right now, uh, that obviously this is a problem out there. I mean, the good news is that only a third of you have had several of these problems, but clearly, you know, it's an issue. And, and you're at the right place today. So here's the data there on your screen. Um, you know, about a third of you have had several failed implementations. Or some of you, two-thirds of you have roughly have experienced this at least once. So clearly it, it, it's an issue and, and hopefully today we can give you kind of a roadmap about how to apply design thinking to get, to, to, to get over that, that hump. So there's four kind of traditional approaches to selecting technology. And the first one that I was just decrying was this whole sort of horse race that somebody's going to declare one a winner and, and one a loser. And the real life is this is really contextual to what you actually need. Uh, the second thing that we see a lot, particularly in the digital marketing space, is this love at first sight. You know, I saw this awesome vendor. They could do all this great stuff. Uh, let's just go with them, and it'll solve all of our problems. And that's rarely the case. Um, some of these tools do indeed demo very well. We should always remember that every vendor has competitors, and Jared's going to walk us through a process where you actually line them up and test them against their competitors. And then you may find that after spending a lot of time or what we would sometimes call a series of increasingly intimate dates, um, you discover that this isn't the one that you're going to marry, that love at first sight doesn't last. The third problem is what we call the my cousin Vinny approach. So this is, you know, someone else in our industry uses this tool, so we should too, you know, or my cousin down the street, you know, uses WordPress and it works really well for him, so obviously it's going to work really well for us. Now, of course, you do want to go out and talk to your peers, but you do have to remember, too, that there's probably something about your organization that's different, that you're trying to differentiate yourself, or you may be at a different level of maturity or have a different set of business priorities. So you really need to go, yes, take people's recommendations, but then also put, it, put the tools through their paces. The fourth one is what we call happiness is a stack of warm binders, and this one seems like the most scientific approach, but in some ways it's the most pernicious because it almost always leads to waterfall type things is if we just organize all of these reams and reams of requirements and then try to put priorities around them and match them against business objectives and then apply weightings to them, we come up with this totally Excel-driven pseudoscientific approach to selection that really is in some ways the opposite of the kind of uh, human creative approach that Lou was talking about. It's almost the opposite of design thinking. It's just working from features out when really it's going to be real live human beings who are going to be using these tools. So you have to have an approach that is much more human centered and applies design thinking um, rather than just reams of checklists. The vendors have seen all the checks and, and they can check all the boxes. It's really more not what does the tool do, but how does it work? And that getting to that how takes a really design-oriented type of approach. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jared, who's now going to take us on a more kind of positive, proactive tour of just how to apply design thinking to technology selection. So Jared, over to you. Thank you. And, and before I, I get into the meat of, of this, this 
better way, as, as we like to call it. I do just want to just remind everyone that if you do have questions as we go through this, please feel free to, to, to put those in the, in the GoToWebinar uh, control panel, and like I said, we'll get to as many of those as possible. So, as Lou mentioned, design thinking is not a new term, and as Tony mentioned, there's problems with the traditional approach to tech selection. So when we went about looking to write this new book, we, we have been thinking about how can we apply what everyone is talking about as a better way, this design way of, of attacking problems. How can we apply that way of thinking to this, this problem of, of this broken tech selection process? And what we did is we, we went out and looked at, 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 at a variety of influences and a variety of our own experiences and having helped organizations over the last 20 or so years uh, go through these types of processes. And what we did is we tried to say, how can we, how can we change this in a way that, that makes, as Tony mentioned, more, makes this process more human? And so we looked at, at Stanford's uh, design school, um, you know, as Lou mentioned, Stanford has done a lot of work in, in, in defining uh, design thinking over the years, and I really like this graphic that's become kind of ubiqu ubiquitous uh, out there when, when people talk about design thinking. It's really a five-step um, uh, type methodology where you're talking about empathizing, defining, ideating, prototyping, and testing. And I'm going to take you through just really quickly how we apply these, these five um, steps to the, the tech selection process. So the, the first one is empathizing. And what we recommend here is that in, instead of going out and starting any new te technology uh, acquisition project by going out and trying to scour your enterprise and, and, and write down every single uh, possible uh, feature requirement, um, I, I would submit to you that that is not humanizing the process. That is not empathizing with, with, with people's needs. So instead, an alternative approach that we recommend is that you, you try to hone in on what we call the really the differentiating requirements of your organization. What makes your, your, um, your situation, your challenges, your goals unique? and then create a narrative scenario that truly describes this entire experience. So you're not trying to get into the actual features that you want in, in, a, in a checklist type form, but you're, you're actually creating some narrative scenarios that describe your people, your processes, your content, your environments. And you do so in a way that is, again, descriptive without being prescriptive. So by doing that, you really get to understand the true problems that, that your people are having and, and you begin to really humanize humanize the problem as opposed to just creating a, a real laundry list of, of potential requirements. The next step is, is the definition phase and this is where we start to apply it to defining what it is you're actually looking for. And you know, one of the biggest mistakes that we see uh, enterprises encounter when they're going through a process like this, and it's really sad because it's, 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 it's tough to see a, a, pro a project like this go off the rails really early in the process, and that is shortlisting the wrong vendors. So instead of looking at that upper right quadrant like Tony, like Tony described, we encourage you to go out and identify the, the vendors that are out there that were truly built to solve the problems that you have. So don't just take that one size fits all look at the at, at the marketplace. Really dig into what are the strengths of these of these vendors and start to align those vendors with, with, with the strengths that that um, that re most resonate with your needs and make those the vendors that you put on your short list. The next is the ideation phase, and I'm not that thrilled with that, that word. It's kind of overused, I think, in, in today's world, but from, from our perspective, what we see uh, in this phase is you're really allowing the vendors a little bit of leeway to I ideate how their solutions are uh, the best fit for what it is you're trying to do. So the way you do that is you create some vendor demos that are really structured. Okay, so you, you don't let the vendors come in and just give the same, the same demos that they give to everyone else, the same canned demos that always look good and slick. 
what you do is you create a structure that really says we want you to each of each of the vendors you invite to come and do a demo you invite, you say i want you to demonstrate how your solution can meet our scenarios so again you go back to those scenarios that you wrote those narrative scenarios and you say please come in and demo your solutions um, the way that your solution can best meet our, our needs as described in these scenarios. So you're not prescribing a set of features that, that you want them to show you. Rather, they're, they're taking what you've described. They're saying, I understand the problem because you've described it in a, in a very humanistic way. And now I'm going to show you how my solution and my services can help you meet your needs. Um, it, it's a you're giving the vendors a little bit of leeway there, which is great, but you're structuring the demos in a way that you're really able to compare apples to apples to apples um, as you as you go forward and, and, and try to evaluate them side by side. The next phase is the prototype phase. And here, this ideally happens when you've been able to winnow down your choices to your final two. Um, we, we sometimes call this final phase a, a bake-off phase, or it, it's also known as a competitive proof of concept phase. And here, what you want to do is go back to those scenarios again, bring those scenarios back, but maybe you're, maybe you're choosing a subset of, of those scenarios, and you ask the vendors now to, to really mimic a, a real project um, as much as, as you can. And what you do is you take is you have the vendors actually lead you through this project just like you would in re if you were if you were starting an implementation. So they're going to actually be um, using your your people as stakeholders. You might be uh, installing this this software in in real environments. Either it's the real cloud environments that you you plan on using or uh, your real on-premise environments. You want to get real content into the system. As, as possible, you want to be, you want to mimic some real workflows if, if that's relevant to you. But the the key the key here is to make it to make it real. And by doing this, you learn so much about what it is going to be like to work with the technology, but also what it's like to work with the vendors and the professional services and the implementation teams behind that. Um, so tons of lessons can be learned, and ideally, you do this with your two finalists. It's pretty resource intensive, but if you, you, you learn so many lessons by working with multiple different options, you can, even with whoever emerges as, as the winner, you can almost always take lessons that you learned from the other vendors and apply that to an actual implementation as well. So the final, the final um, piece to this puzzle is, is testing. And, you know, Tony mentioned that this isn't always a, a waterfall. Uh, this is not a, a better way to do this is not a waterfall approach. So I'm not saying you wait to the end to test. What, what our methodology outlines uh, is really to test at every phase of this process. So it truly is a winnowing down process, but you create those, those scenarios that truly humanize what it is you're trying to do at the outset. You test them via uh, an RFP to the right shortlisted vendors. You test them via custom demos that, that, you've, that you've structured. And you test them via head-to-head -head, uh, pilots in a real competitive environment. So lots of lessons are learned along the way, but you're testing, testing, testing at every single phase. All right, so that, we think, is a, is a much better approach to, to tech selection. Lou, I'm going to turn it over to you to see if we have any questions, and uh, we'll be happy to, to take more as, as they emerge uh, as we answer a few. Yeah, or if anyone well, has no any vignettes that they want to share, that, that would be great, too. Um, the, uh, you know, I'm, I'm curious to hear from those two or three people who said they never had a failed selection. So uh, definitely, if you've got any comments or any input or anything you disagree with, feel free to, to, to put that comment in the box as well. But anyway, go ahead, Lou. Yeah, well, I have a question. Uh, you know, one of the things that really runs through your book as well as your presentation is just re the reliance on story, trying to understand the, 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 you know, the story that's behind the experience that an end user should have and, and so forth. I thought we could maybe um, start by having you guys uh, tell a story or two about how this approach has, has worked in the wild. You know, a success story would, would be a great place to start. I can start one off, Tony. You know, I, I can think of sure. one one client we worked with very recently. They're a 
large beverage company um, and you know they were looking uh, specifically at digital asset management technology and they had recognized this need for several years and when they called us they had started and unfortunately stopped this process two separate times so and when we when we got involved what we kept finding was they were getting bogged down in that requirements phase because they'd start this process and they'd start asking questions about all right who needs digital asset management and this is a huge organization and they kept asking questions and it led to more stakeholders and more stakeholders and more stakeholders and more stakeholders and finally their requirement list was a little bit like that graphic that you showed earlier Tony it was a, it was a massive massive requirements list that had everyone so confused they didn't even know what they were actually looking for at the end of the day it was just this laundry list of requirements that no one could really make sense out of so when we when we really told them to scrap the detailed requirements as the first step and really tried to get them focused in on creating these narrative user stories that truly describe what it is they were trying to do ways they wanted to work in the future that changed the game and they were able to to bring in a technology that really worked for for them yeah, that's, that's, it does. It really it can break through a lot of log jams. The other example um, that I'll share is with a large manufacturing company that subscribed to our research, and they had a major knowledge management initiative, and they spent a lot of time arguing, like, is this a document management problem? Is it a web content management problem? Is it a portal problem? You know, what, what technologies? And they were mixing apples and oranges, and, and, and it was all getting their analysis just totally paralyzed them. So we said, look, let's just go in and do the user story. So we went in um, and, co and partnered with them and developed, I think, ultimately seven or eight user journeys, both internal and, 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 ex and external client journeys. And ultimately, the stories told us that what they needed primarily was a portal. Uh, and it was very interesting. These often don't always lead you to portal, which is not the most uh, widely deployed technology anymore, though it's still there's times when you do need an enterprise portal, and there's certainly tools out there that we evaluate. But this, we couldn't break through that log jam of kind of defining what marketplace are we and what technology we need until we actually went through the stories. I love that. Uh, I mean, you know, this is something I've certainly seen in my uh, life as a consultant way back when, where uh, the language, the jargon gets in the way of understanding the problem. So if you come in talking about portals or some other particular technology, you get away from the true diagnoses of the problem. And the user story, I think, is just a fantastic approach to kind of clear out that jargon and really humanize your understanding of the problem that you're trying to solve from the user's perspective. So we do have a question uh, from uh, Emily Vargas. She asks, what do you recommend when your parent company is driving the ship to make decisions despite upper management pushing to have the dam experts on the team make the decisions. We've had uh, we have had some say, let's see, we've had some uh, say in it, but we're trying to prepare for the aftermath we'll have to deal with in order to support our users. Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, and and we see it a lot. Um, you know, there are reasons sometimes for an enterprise as wide solution, the problem is that sometimes there are certain uh, units that, that that suffer from that, or um, it's not really the right the right solution. And hopefully, um, you know, we, we can if you get in early enough, you can recast this as a as in in a business context. And again, using these journeys to show why maybe one solution is suboptimal and what are the business consequences going to be. Um, you know, the, uh, in, in terms of dealing with the aftermath and supporting your users, that's obviously a tough one as well. Um, I think that, again, if you can go back and show the business consequences of the decision, hopefully you can get some resources in return to ameliorate the situation with either some greater customization um, or some, some better uh, training and education. But, you know, we run into this, honestly, a lot, and it, it it's where somebody else made the decision uh, using p potentially not a very good um, methodology, and at that point, very often, you know, the the horse has left the barn. Uh, so, Jared, maybe you you have a more a, a different take on this, but um, no, I'd say the earlier like, you can get in, the better. Yeah, definitely not a different take, but just just going back to those those scenarios being so important to this process because. If you don't have those scenarios created, 
it's very hard to go to a parent company and say, well, our needs are, are you sure you're making, meeting our needs? Because if you tell them they needed, that you need a dam, they're gonna say, well, we'll get you a dam and there's a, there's a bunch to choose from. You know, we cover 30 plus digital asset management systems in our, in our research. But if you have those, at least, uh, those scenarios documented, at least for your needs, you're able to then, even if the, the train is already running from a selection process from the parent company, you're able to say, okay, but what you're thinking, can it address these needs as we've described them here and get them to prove it? And, you know, they might not always listen, but at least you, you have something concrete for them to, to respond to, right? As opposed to this esoteric um, technology need that they just may say, well, we're meeting that need by giving you a new technology. Well, no, you get, get into those details. And the best way to do that we see time and time again is to, is to document them in narrative scenario, scenario form. Excellent. Um, uh, one question I'm always wondering about, I know a, a number of, of people do who, who talk with you is technologies in particular that you're talking about, is it any technology that your approach is going to help with? And also uh, size of the organization, if I'm in a, a small company, can I benefit from this approach? Yeah. <laughs> so I'll start, Tony, and you know, I'll just say, <laughs> you know, you know we, it's been interesting, you know, we cover eight different marketplaces and we've done, we've applied this process to all eight of those areas. Certainly um, we've even been asked to apply this, this methodology to other areas. We've applied it to, you know, enterprise video technology and product information management and, and CRM technology before we had a CRM research stream. We do now. Um, and we, we, the nice thing we found is, it works for all of those. Now, the common thread there is those are all content-based technologies, and I would say that it, it, this this approach definitely works best for content-based uh, technologies. But we've even in the the early returns from the the sales on our on our book, I've heard from some people who say they've applied it to um, uh, enterprise yeah, like uh, BI communications. Yeah, yeah the, but the, even their their phone systems within their organizations, um, or you know, and that's at a large level. But and, and I've heard from some folks who are working for really small small organizations who are really just lost for a process or, or, or yearning for a process because the typical process has always been I'm going to go just Google some solutions and and try them out, try 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 the free the free um, trial version that I can download and whatnot. But when you when you apply a process like this and a, a, a process that's inherently testable in nature, we I haven't found a technology that it hasn't worked for yet. That's right, and you Excellent. know the, the traditional line that we have is that is that this works for business-facing software, um, so that can include even data-intensive uh, like like business intelligence or data visualization, big data tools, that sort of thing, because if there's a business person actually using the tool, then they have a story that needs to be told about how we're going to drive business value out of it and how it's going to work for them. The interesting thing is that you, you can also use it for more kind of lower level, you know, technology solutions. Let's say you're looking for a new virtualization uh, platform and, and that's a space that's changing obviously quite a bit with public and private clouds and, and everything else. And you know, you're, the technology people who are using the solution are also have are important stakeholders in any of these. We often have designers and technology people as one of the personas and journeys and their journeys, even in a business facing tool. So you can use this methodology. As Jared said, you know, the, the key thing is testing and iteration and, and having real life humans interact with the technology before you pick it. Now in terms of can you use it for large and larger and smaller enterprises, sure. Larger enterprise may be more at stake, but small enterprises too, depending on you know, how critical the software is to your success, um, you want to spend more or less time. So you can definitely skip some steps. You can invite a couple vendors in for demos. You can go straight to bake off. There's a lot of ways that you can simplify and shortcut, understanding the risks that are inherent there, to right size the selection process to the level of effort and resources that you're likely going to be applying to. Okay. Uh, let me remind people, uh, please uh, submit questions. Uh, and while we're waiting for you, I, I have another one. What about vendors? How do they feel about this process? Yeah, believe it or not, they actually like this approach, most of them. Um, because, you know, the, the one thing that, 
that I've heard, I hear all the time is vendors saying, this is so much better than just getting that stack of requirements. Because if you think about it, if your team can't even figure out what you're trying to do with that requirements, how, how are these vendors supposed to figure out what they're trying to, what, what they need to, to propose um, or what your problem really is? You know, they're, they're just looking at a bunch of line items in, a, in an Excel spreadsheet usually and saying, well, I understand some of this, we have some of this, but we might not have this, we might have this. They can, at least with the, the narrative scenario approach, they can better um, qu qualify, you know, is this a, a, even a, a good fit for, for my solution and should we even respond to this RFP? And uh, what we found is, is certainly um, a more educated responder. Now, I say that with, to, to preface my next statement, and that is the the next part of our process where we actually make them really do a lot of work to prepare for those demos and a lot of work to prepare for the for the proof of concept. They might not all like that because you are asking them to 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 do some work. And at the end of the day, I think um, they uh, the vendors understand it, but um, it's taken some education for some vendors to to really understand that this is in their best interest to put in this work to prove their, their worth. Do you, yeah, do you I mean, see any correlation? Uh, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Tony. Well, I was just saying, we very often see vendors trying to reverse engineer your intentions and what is it that you really want in a typical kind of RFP. And so by being very transparent about it and encapsulating it in stories, they take a lot of guesswork out for them and they can start really kind of showing off um, their, their platform. Um, as Jared said, you know, sometimes there's work involved. Um, occasionally in a complex POC, um, you may have to do some, some creative financing around that, and we can talk about that. Uh, but, but, yeah, in general, we get really positive response from the vendors, who, particularly the vendors who believe that they're a good fit. So uh, this is a follow-up. Is there any correlation you found in terms of receptiveness among vendors by industry type, by size? Any other type of category? No, uh, it, it, it is. It's interesting because um, you know we've seen the largest and the smallest vendors beg off for one reason or another. Uh, we've seen it work across all the different segments, um, and a lot of it, honestly, sometimes just comes down to random uh, things going on in their world that they may be a very busy quarter for them, or maybe a very free quarter for them, or they perceive it's a good opportunity or they don't. Um, and that's one of the nice things if you do go the RFP route where you're sending it out to six, yeah, you may only get responses from four or five, but they're probably going to be very motivated responses. Got it. Okay, question from John. Uh, does the book have tips on writing the narrative scenarios? Yes. It does. Um, and, and we have a particular style that we apply in the book and we have the, the book then links you to some examples, John, that you can see online of some actual different types of scenarios from different types of, of marketplace segments. Um, we tend to, to do more user stories. Uh, there are other types of stories out there in the world, like job stories and so forth. And so what the way we, we, we give you some examples about how we like to do it, but by the same token, we're also very agnostic. I mean, it's, there's, this is a, as Lou can, can share, is a rapidly changing and adapting world of design thinking and a lot of different ways of doing stories. So we're kind of agnostic on the way you do stories, just that you do apply a particular methodology. Yeah, and, and I'll just add that that we tried to, in in the entire book, at every single chapter, we tried to, to give tips and, and make it as, as practical as possible so that you can, you can make this process your own. Um, and in addition to those tips, we also have some what we like to call some real stories um, of, of how some organizations that we've worked with uh, went about this. And so there's a lot of lessons to be learned there as well. Well, I mean, one of the reasons I wanted to work with you guys is you're very much um, occasionally snarky, but uh, very much of the no BS writing approach and thinking approach. So it's, uh, it's refreshing to see uh, people talking about a topic like this with the jargon stripped away, uh, obviously it's coming from a neutral party, uh, a very independent party where um, we are, are able to kind of strip away some of the, the marketing language that kind of clutters up these conversations um, and that vendors flood us with. 
Um, speaking of which, speaking of vendors and marketing language, how about using this approach with agency selection? Have you ever seen that done? Yeah, as a matter of fact, we have. And, and this is maybe one of the biggest surprises that we had. You know, we, we're known as the, the technology evaluators, right? Kind of the consumer reports for technology, for content-based technologies. And, but in a few years back, we actually had this, before we even thought of writing this book, we had a client come to us and say, we had helped them with a technology selection previous, and they said, we want to take that methodology that you led us through with that technology selection that was so successful in our organization and apply it to selecting our agency of record. This was at, a, at one of the biggest hospitals in the world, um, and it was a little daunting but at, at first, but when we, when we started to think about it, we, we said, this really can apply. And the key here was we, we really tried to, again, humanize the needs of this, of this children's hospital. And instead of testing technology vendors, we were te testing really the, the methodologies and the people that were behind this agency, that th these agencies that were, were bidding uh, to be the agency of record for this, for this hospital. Mm -hmm. and, we learned a ton about from about the, these people and and their the way they went about their own design processes and at the end of the day, the 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 decision and it was a really a multi million dollar decision was actually an easy one because they were sure about who who the best fit for for their organization really was. Yeah, and that's what great. was great about that, I mean, it's like a, it's a it's a simulation. At the end of the day, that's what a bake-off should be, a simulation. What is life like going to be either with this vendor or what is life like going to be with this particular agency or a systems integrator on a large project? And this, it's really about can you be creative about the way we simulate this so that uh, we have a kind of more human understanding of, of what it's going to be like. And the book actually has a full chapter on how to adapt the process to selecting a technology in a greater or a creative agency. Might, I might have to adapt it for how to select authors for our future books, but um, <laughs> we, we, did get, uh, we did get another question. Uh, not, that wouldn't apply to you, of course. Uh, we did get another question. This is from Robert. Do you recommend deciding an open source, for example, Drupal or commercial license CMS before developing an RFP? Yeah, no. On that particular question, I, I would definitely say no, Robert. Uh, and there's a couple of things going on here. One is specifically about license models, because that's really what we're talking about is open source versus commercial, just to give you the license model. We're seeing a lot of conversion, where even open source projects like Drupal, you have one of the main drivers of the new code base, Acquia, as a commercial entity. So there's this kind of conversion of, of commercial and open source that's been going on for the last decade and I think is accelerating. Um, but also because you know, making those kind of coarse grain filters before you develop the stories um, uh, uh, is, is shortchanging yourself. What you really want to do is develop the story and then have that drive, okay, what are the likely set of solutions that are going to work for me? Now, there are vendor intangibles always to consider. We call them strategic considerations, uh, particularly around the ecosystem, technical support, technical modernity, which is the nice way of saying, you know, the, the converse to technical debt. And so these are important considerations in your final selection as well, and the book goes into that. But uh, typically we would say, and for that matter, another one would be, you know, .NET versus Java versus PHP. You know, we're only going to look at Java uh, uh, solutions. And, you know, fortunately we see a lot of organizations going away from that as they bring more full stack capabilities internally into their organization, um, but, you know, really trying to avoid making coarse grain decisions until you've got the stories down and then have the stories drive the whole filtration process. Um, by the way, everyone, uh, we, we have time for some more questions, but let, let me get back to one that's a bit more cultural. Um, when you're dealing with uh, old-fashioned, let's put it, decision-making in a large enterprise. Um, just generally, uh, people who are just generally resistant to anything new, are there any strategies you found that have been really helpful for getting this approach established? Hmm. Well, 
the first thing, and I know we've mentioned it a bunch of times, is is to really break that break that cycle of of thinking that you have to design the system in its totality to, at the start. And if you can convince people to say, all right, we're gonna we're gonna describe what we can, what we're trying to do here in a different way as opposed to going out and and getting all of those requirements. Uh, what I found is getting a getting a, the right stakeholders involved in that process to so that they feel like they actually contribute to to creating those those holistic narratives is the first step in this of any change management and as as anyone who's been through a, a technology project before knows you know managing change is critical to the success of 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 any pro of any technology project so but the, what we've seen is the first step to managing that change is involving some people in a way that we, we make them really feel heard and then parroting back to them the, the differentiating requirements in the in these use case narratives you you get buy-in you get buy-in right away and instead of you know your buy-in being just requirement number 53 through 63 in a spreadsheet you actually feel like I can I can see myself as a an actor in that narrative um, and and you know that that tends to to create a lot more of, of a of a personal relationship and and buy-in with the with the process as a whole and that those scenarios carry carry through the whole the whole process so if you can get that buy-in at the outset it, it's a big step to changing changing traditional thinking yeah and as a practical matter I think one of the things that when we run into sometimes, which is a distrust or fear around this new approach, uh, sometimes from procurement people, sometimes from project managers or others who are just used to a very different methodology, and so this feels, you know, potentially threatening, is just say, look, just let us get to the RFP. Let me show you the RFP that comes out of this, and you'll see that it's so different from any other RFP you've ever seen that then you'll be able to understand. So, so just you know, have enough faith in us and in this process to have us get to the RFP, and then if you still have issues with it, we'll talk about it. And in my experience, you know, 95% of the time when they see the, the how different this, this RFP looks, and even the way that we ask questions of the vendors and that we test the vendors in the RFP and in the process, um, then it's very, very often a kind of an aha moment. Like, okay, I, I get this. I see where this is going, um, and I can see that there's still a role for me as the procurement person, the project manager, what have you, is just that maybe I have kind of a different role than I had before. But I think anyone who genuinely cares in particular about business IT alignment is going to see the value of this. Uh, it's just that sometimes they need an example, as Jared said, to get there. And that example is often a, a, a peer organization that went first, I would imagine. Do you see that as an important thing? Well, they did it. I guess we can do it. Sure, but even then, that's kind of secondhand. I think what I was what I was getting at is, you know, trust the team, the selection team, to to use this methodology in the book to get us to an actual artifact, which is the first mm -hmm. major artifact, which is this story-based RFP. And when I get into the story-based RFP, and I can then show that to my peers, that often then leads to an aha moment among my peers, using our actual enterprise and our stores. They say, okay, I get this. Like maybe we should have used this for some of our other selections as well. Uh, a follow-up question, uh, and I also want to remind people if they have any more questions, this is about your last chance to, to submit them. Uh, the framing uh, around terms like story uh, may bring a little resistance as well. Do, do you find that there, in, in the, the terminology that you use in the book, are there particular terms like story that just sort of raise people's hackles and uh, that we need to be a little cautious of when we use it in our own organizations? Yeah, I mean, I think the thing, the really important thing is not to be too doctrinaire about this because you're you're in the middle of the UX field, and so you know that people make make really fine distinctions sometimes on terminology, and sometimes go to wars around this sort of thing. And and what I would say is, so long as you're applying user-centered design and design thinking, that it, it doesn't matter. As long as you're using a coherent methodology, there it doesn't matter whether you call it a story, a scenario, a use case a journey, a set of top tasks. I mean, all of these sorts of things, you might understand them as an expert in this field, Lou, is somewhat different. 
the the key thing is that it's a it is it is a narrative, right? And then it's a narrative mm -hmm. example that simulates how you're going to use it. And then whatever you need to do to call it whatever it needs to be is totally fine. Yeah. The other the other loaded term that that we dance around in the book is we call our process an agile uh, methodology, and I know agile is loaded in in not only the the UX field but in technology technology fields as well. Um, and when we talk about agile, we're talking about making this process uh, adaptable in a way that it, it fits your organization. So we we prescribe a set of steps, but you don't have to follow these steps exactly in the in the same order, um, or spend equal amounts of time on every step. You know, we talk about in the book how you can you can make this process your own um, and make it make it iterative, hands-on, and 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 it is truly adaptive in that sense. So there are some terms that we 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 try to address in there, but your point is is a good one. There's you know we we don't want you to be to get too too obsessed on the on the terms, but rather rather really focus on making this as real and as testable as possible. You know, before we wrap up, uh, I want to uh, do a quick um, demonstration. I have a visual aid. This is the book. Let me turn it. It's, it's actually it's three-dimensional, so I can actually turn it on its side. I don't want to. And you see how thin it is. It's under 200 pages, and that's really important to know. We, we, uh, the book isn't trying to uh, slam you continually with its brilliance. It can do it in an elegant, quick package under 200 pages. And uh, we know from our research how important that is to you as a reader. So I hope you keep that in mind and, and you'll consider picking up a copy. Uh, we have a discount code uh, as shown on the slide there right at the very bottom. And uh, you can also get the book pretty much anywhere else, Amazon, etc. But uh, from us, 20% off. And we invite anyone who does get the book to send us your feedback. Let us know what you think. You know, we'd love to hear hear how you applied this this methodology to your own selection processes. You know, as I mentioned, there are a lot of stories in the book, but we want to we hope we, to gather a bunch more from all of you. And uh, we've we've started to hear those stories trickling in, which is which is fantastic. But uh, fee, please feel free to to circle back with us and so that we can uh, see how you're using using the methodology. So I think we're, uh, we're, we're going to wrap it. Um, Tony, anything to add? No, just thanks, Lou, for uh, being a great publisher and for joining us today. These conversations, I think, help take a really abstract kind of concept, which is a particular methodology, and, and hopefully make it more real for people. So uh, on behalf of the three of us, I'd like to just thank everyone for, uh, for, for joining this week. And uh, let's, let's stay in touch. Thanks, everyone, and especially to our, our sources of questions, Emily, John, and Robert. Thanks again. Thank you. Thanks. Bye now.